So it timed out on us again. So this Elmo is working so wonderfully for us tonight. Okay, so moving forward, we now have our right triangle that we created around our x and y coordinate plane. Okay, from here, um, going back to the general, def the general definition of what a trig function is, um, the first thing I want to point out is the theta on the outside. So we have this greater than 90 angle that's an orange, okay? And what we did is we created a right triangle on the shortest end of that angle, and that is labeled in green. The theta on the outside, which is obviously greater than 90, is going to act similarly. So it's obviously not the same angle measure, but it's going to act similarly in terms of its ratios as if that theta was on the inner right-hand side of that right triangle. So our thetas are going to be around the origin. From there, we can come up with our sine, cosine, and tangent um, trig ratios using x, y, and r as our opposite hypotenuse and opposite hypotenuse and adjacent sides. So from our interior theta, obviously this y side is going to be our opposite. R is clearly our hypotenuse and x is our adjacent. So let's use x, y, and r in replacement of adjacent, opposite, and hypotenuse. So since sine of theta, sine is usually our, so I'm going to write my soca toa up here just to remind us. So ka toa, remember, if you don't have that memorized, now is the time to memorize it. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so opposite over hypotenuse. But I'm going to replace it now with my x, y, and r values, or at least the variables. So opposite is going to be y over hypotenuse. In this case, it's going to be r. Cosine is always represented as our adjacent side over our hypotenuse. So cosine of theta, when we're dealing with the trig functions in our x and y coordinate plane, is going to be x, which is our adjacent, over our hypotenuse, which is r. Tangent is represented as opposite over adjacent. Opposite in this case is y over adjacent, which is x. And we know x cannot equal 0. Cosecant is the flip of sine, the reciprocal of sine, so that's hypotenuse over opposite. So we know this is going to be r over y. We know y cannot equal 0. Secant is hypotenuse over adjacent the reciprocal of cosine, so this is going to be r over x, where x is not equal to 0. And lastly, cotangent is adjacent over opposite, which means we're looking at x over y, so y is not equal to um, 0. The reason why we specified x and y not equal to 0 here is because obviously it's not going to be, um, x and y is not going to be at your origin. But more importantly, why we didn't specify your r is not equal to zero is because in this case, when we have a triangle, your radius is never going to be equal to zero. Your radius is always going to be a positive value. So let's look and see how this applies when we try to evaluate trig functions of a given point. Okay? So in this example three, it's already given to you the graphed out version of the point. So I want to take a second and pretend that we don't even have that graph there, okay? So let's say, for example, that in example three, all we know is what we're provided on the sheet without the actual example um, drawn out for us, okay? And I'm going to show you the steps that you can take to create this for yourself because that's going to become part of your checkpoints five, six, and seven in the next page. You're going to have to do that on your own. So starting out with example 3, let negative 12 comma 5 be a point on the terminal side of angle theta in standard position. Evaluate sine, cosine, and tangent of the functions of theta. So the first thing we want to do is we want to graph the point negative 12, 5. And we're going to do that off to the right hand side. Create my x axes, my y axes. And from there, I'm going to plot the point, we always start from our origin, 0, 0, 
negative 12, 5, negative 12, remember your order pair always goes x first, y second. So negative 12 means from my origin, I'm going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 units to the left in the negative x direction. And then my y is telling me to go positive 5 units up. So from my origin, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 units up, 12 units over. I'm going to end up with a point, negative 12, comma 5. Once I graph that point, what I next want to do is connect that point to my origin. So I'm going to create that point there. From that, from that, um, that line that I just created, I'm going to create a right triangle. And I'm always creating my right triangle in relationship to my x-axis. So I'm not creating my right triangle and attaching it to my y-axis. I'm always connecting my terminal point to my x-axis. So I'm going to create my right triangle there. Okay? So obviously, this is my initial side of the angle. It's the initial side because it's fixed on my x-axis. If I continue this line out, this is my terminal side of my um, angle right here. So I actually have an exterior angle, the angle I'm looking at, is actually the one I'm drawing in green. But from that angle that's obviously greater than 90, this angle right here, which is theta, I just created in orange a right triangle from that angle, okay? What pieces of information do I know? Well, I first know that my exterior theta is going to work very similar to my interior theta, okay? And both of those thetas are going to be around your origin, okay? It's never going to be the upper one. We're never going to call this one your theta. From that point, we know if this distance down to my x-axis is represented as 5 units, because it's five units tall. I got that from my original ordered pair. I also know from that point to my origin, there's negative 12 units represented there. Just like we talked about before, if I swung this all the way around my x and y coordinate plane, I'd create a circle. So the distance from this terminal point to my origin is represented as my radius, okay? So to come up with sine, tangent, and cosine, or sine, cosine, and tangent, I have these values, the y over r, y over x, x over r, from my general definitions from above. I need to first know what my value of r is. And since it's a right triangle, I can replace x and y with a and b, and my radius with c, and use my Pythagorean theorem. So the Pythagorean theorem that I can get is going to be x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Okay, that's how we can find your radius. Plugging in x, negative 12 squared, plus plugging in my y, 5 squared is equal to r squared. Negative 12 squared is 144. 5 squared is 25. Add these two together, I get 169 is equal to r squared, square root both sides, and I know r is equal to 13. Since r is equal to 13, that is my hypotenuse. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, which is y over r, which gives me values of 5 over 13. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. In this case, it's x over r, so that gives me negative 12 over 13. And tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent, which is y over x, which gives me 5 over negative 12. And that's your final answer. All they wanted you to do was evaluate the sine, cosine, and tangent of that function of theta. And that's what you just did. You found your, your radius value and plugged in those proportions, um, those side ratios for each of those three main trig functions. If you flip it over to the next page, you have five, um, three checkpoints, 5, 6, and 7. Your directions for 5, 6, and 7 are given to you. They want you to do exactly what we just did in example 3. They want you to show your work, sketch each triangle um, in the coordinate plane, label your sides correctly, and then evaluate your sine, cosine, and tangent functions.
Moving on to the next piece of your notes. Your next piece of your notes deal with quadrantal angles, okay? And quadr <coughs> quadrantal angles are pretty important because you actually have you actually have five of them. Two of them are actually coterminal. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But these quadrantal angles is going to help us set the basis of what we're going to later call the unit circle. So your quadrantal angles, so if your terminal side that lies on your axes, then you have a quadrantal angle. Quadrantal angle basically means that you have an angle that is not in a quadrant, okay? So an angle that is not in the quadrant means you're not in quadrant one, two, three, or four. You're on your axes. You have four, actually five, 360 degrees is also considered quadrantal, but zero and 360 are coterminal. They exist in the same spot on your x and y coordinate plane. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to come up with um, a couple different proportions of these quadrantal angles that is going to help us evaluate your sine, cosine, and tangent functions of each of these five um, quadrantal angles. So first we're going to look at theta when theta equals zero degrees. Okay, Theta equaling zero degrees is also the same as theta equaling 360 degrees. Okay. So let's look at these quadrantal angles. The first is your vertex is always at your origin, 0, 0. Your initial side is always on your positive x-axis. And at 0 degrees or 360 degrees, your terminal side is going to lay right on top of your initial side. Okay. So if that's the case, if your two sides, your initial side and your, and your terminal side, lay right on top of each other, if I picked a point on here, okay, we're going to pick a point on here, we're going to obviously call this point x, y, y. If your point is on your, your, um, your terminal side is on top of your, your, um, initial side, then a couple key things. The first is you're no longer going to have um, a, hop, uh, a hypotenuse, so to speak. So this distance, and if I'm just going to kind of graph it right here. So let's just say that this dotted line was before the green line that kind of closed and lays on top of your initial side. This point right here, this distance we know as our radius right? Because if we swing this all the way around, we would create a circle. But if these two lay right on top of each other, this point to this point is also going to be the distance of your radius, okay? So that's just something I wanted to point out. If this distance is your radius, the point that lays on your x and y coordinate plane, this point is going to have an x value, this distance is going to be r, and remind yourself that you're not going to be up or down in a quadrant, so your y value is going to be 0. So we can represent this point as r comma 0. Okay? Which means your x is the same distance as your radius, and your y value at this particular point is 0. This will come in handy in just a couple minutes. Moving on to our next quadrantal angle meaning we're not in quadrant one, we're moving right in between quadrant one and quadrant two, is 90 degrees. So your vertex is at the origin. Your initial side is on your x and y coordinate plane, or is on your positive x, and your terminal side is on your, um, your y. All right, at this point, if I have a point x and y on my terminal side, Obviously, this distance here is going to be the same as your, um, as your radius, all right, this distance right here. So if I had to mark this point, this point would be 0, comma, r. Your x value is 0, your y value we're going to call the same distance as your radius. Moving on to 180 degrees. <coughs> 
your vertex is at your origin, your initial side is on your positive x, which means your terminal side is on your negative x side, so you have a flat line here. This is your theta distance. This, of course, was your theta distance up top. If I have a point on here, on your terminal side, x and y, the distance around here is going to be the same thing as your radius. So if I had to mark this point, normally it would be negative x, 0. So we're going to call this negative r, 0. Where x is obviously your negative r distance, your y is going to be 0. We'll talk again a little bit more in depth in the next example. Moving around, theta, the next um, quadrantal angle is 270 degrees. Your vertex is at the origin, your initial side is on your positive x, and this distance is 270, so you're between quadrants 3 and quadrants 4. If I picked a point on my terminal side, I would normally be calling this negative y distance, so 0 for x, negative r for y. And then back to 360 again, your coterminal was 0, and we have the same point. So these points right here are going to be important to know moving forward. And we'll get into a little bit more detail, a little bit today, but even more so when we start building our unit circle. Okay? So moving on to example 4. Example 4 asks us to evaluate the sine, cosine, and tangent functions of theta when theta is equal to 270 degrees. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to graph what 270 degrees looks like, and it's going to actually look very similar to the last one we just did. So since theta is 270 degrees, I want to make sure I graph it in standard position so my vertex is at my origin. My initial side is on my positive x. My initial side is on my negative y. This is obviously 270 degrees. Picking a point on my terminal side, I know that point is going to be represented as 0, negative r. So I'm going to plug these values in and we're going to evaluate what sine, cosine, and tangent is at 270 degrees. So first, since x in this case is 0 and y is negative r, I'm just going to plug these new values in to my sine, cosine, and tangent um, ratios. So since sine is y over r, since y is negative r, negative r over r is the same thing as negative 1. So the sine of 270 degrees, I'll write that down here, sine of 270 degrees, is always going to be negative 1. Cosine is the same thing as x over r since x is 0 over r. Cosine of 270 degrees, this will always be 0. Tangent is equal to the y over x um, ratio, so since y is negative r, x is 0. I can never divide by 0, so tangent of 270 degrees will always be undefined. And of course, we're going to talk about that much later. We just want to make sure you get exposed to a couple of these concepts right now. Okay? So that is your example four, evaluating sine, cosine, and tangent of 270 degrees. Moving on to the last example, dealing with these angles, um, of any measure around your x and y coordinate plane. A couple key things that we want to talk about, and this is again setting the foundations to building your unit circle that's um, slowly going to be coming up. I want to go around and I actually want to fill in my quadrants with the sine of my trig functions. I want to list in all four of my quadrants if my sine, cosine, and tangent functions are actually going to be positive or negative. So to start out, I'm only doing this with my three main trig functions. So obviously I know that the sine of theta is the same thing as y over r. Cosine of theta is obviously x over r. And tangent of theta we now know is going to be y over x. These we want to make sure we memorize. 
Okay, so these are going to start replacing our original SOHCAHTOA. We're going to start knowing sine, cosine, and tangent in terms of why X and R we're getting away from adjacent, opposite, and hypotenuse. We're evolving into this understanding of trig. Okay, so we're getting away from what we were, our SOHCAHTOA, and we're building on um, those proportions dealing with X, Y, and R. Couple key things is R is always going to be positive, okay? So around our coordinate plane, in order to have a, a, a radius, any, a, a radius or circle at all, we know we have to have a positive value. So that's always gonna um, be true. Quadrant one, we all know where quadrant one is. Moving um, counterclockwise, we know quadrant two. We can label uh, quadrant three. And of course, quadrant four. Okay? A couple other key things we want to point out in quadrant one we always have a positive x and we always have a positive y. It's a positive x region, positive y region. Quadrant two deals with our negative x region, positive y region. Quadrant three always deals with our negative x region, negative y region. From our origin, quadrant four always deals with our positive x region, negative y region. Okay, and what, how this is going to play important is now we're going to look at our sine, cosine, and tangent values within these quadrants. Okay, so since sine is always y over r, and r is always positive, in quadrant one, y is always positive. So if y is always positive and r is always, always positive, positive over positive will always tell us in quadrant one, we will always have our sine values as positive numbers. Cosine always deals with our x over our r value. x in quadrant one is always positive, r is always positive. So in quadrant one, cosine will always be positive values. In tangent, tangent always deals with y over x. In quadrant one, y is always positive, r, or I'm sorry, x is always positive. Positive over positive tells us that in quadrant one, tangent will also be positive values. Now we're just gonna fill in the rest of the quadrants, doing the exact same thing. Sine, cosine, and tangent of quadrant two. In quadrant two, sine deals with y over r. In quadrant two, our y value is always positive, r is always positive. So our two positives divided together tells us sine will always be positive in quadrant two. Cosine deals with x over r. In quadrant two, x is always negative, r is always positive. Therefore, negative over positive tells us cosine will always be negative values in quadrant two. Tangent always deals with y over x. In quadrant two, y is always positive, x is always negative. Positive divided by negative tells us that our tangent values in quadrant two will always be negative. Moving on to quadrant three, our sine, cosine, and tangent functions of quadrant three. Sine deals with y over r. Y in quadrant three is negative, R is always positive, so our sine values in quadrant three are always negative. X is always negative in quadrant three, R is always positive, negative over positive also tells us our negative, um, our cosine values will always be negative in quadrant three. And lastly, tangent in quadrant three is always Y over X. Negative over negative tells us tangent will always be positive in quadrant three. Lastly, we have quadrant four. In quadrant four, sine is always um, y over r. Y is negative, r is always positive, so sine will always be negative in quadrant four. Cosine deals with x over r. X is always positive in quadrant four. R is always positive, positive over positive tells me co uh, cosine will always be positive values in quadrant four. And tangent is always Y over X. Y is always negative in quadrant four, X is always positive. Negative divided by positive tells you tangent will always be negative in quadrant four.
So eventually, we're going to build on these understandings with our unit circle, and then we're also going to add in our quadrantal angles um, a little bit down the road. Last but not least, so in example five, we're going to be pulling from this information and referring to what we just talked about for those signs of the trig functions. In example five, they want us to determine whether the sine, cos, and tangent of the following angles are positive or negative, okay? So in letter A, because the terminal, I'm going to highlight this, we're dealing with letter A, which is 80 degrees. Obviously, 80 degrees is in quadrant 1. Therefore, since sine of eight, since 80 degrees is in quadrant 1, we know our sine, so we're going to look up top. So looking up at quadrant 1, sine of 80, since it's in quadrant 1, sine will, of 80 will always be positive. Cosine of 80, if we go back up here, quadrant 1, cosine is always positive, since... 80 is um, in quadrant 1. We know cosine is also going to be a positive value. Tangent is always positive in quadrant 1. So since tangent of 80, we are going to expect that value to be positive. Looking at letter B, letter B is 115 degrees. That means we our terminal side lies in quadrant 2. So I'm not going to keep pulling the paper up and down, so I'm going to have you guys refer to your own paper that you're looking at. Sine of 115, because we're in quadrant 2, quadrant 2 always has positive values for their sines. They also have negative values for cosine, and they also have negative values for their tangents. So sine of, negative, or sine of 115 degrees will be a positive value. Cosine of 115 will be negative, and tangent of 115 will also be a negative value. And that's all because of how we stacked our sine of the trig functions in the table right above. Let's quickly fill in C and D. So in C, we obviously travel all the way around to quadrant 4. So our terminal side obviously is in quadrant 4 which means our sine of 325, we can expect to be negative. Cosine of 325, we can expect to be positive. And tangent of 325, we can expect to be negative. And again, those values came from the fact that 325 degrees is in quadrant 4. Last but not least, we have letter D, which is 200 degrees, which is um, our terminal side is in quadrant 3. Therefore, in quadrant 3, all sine values are negative, all cosine values are negative, and all tangent values are positive. So sine, cosine, and tangent of 200 degrees are going to follow that exact same pattern, and that's because of what we did up above. So at this point, we laid a couple pieces of foundation um, that is going to help us build this concept of a unit circle, which is still, I know, a little bit foreign to you, but we'll eventually get there. Um, so at this point, just make sure that you have the checkpoints 5, 6, and 7 um, completely done for the next time that we meet, and then we're going to start building on these quadrantal and quadrant sine, cosine, and tangent values um, real soon, starting with our next class when we meet.